Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. You know, we spend so much of our lives at work, and too often we find ourselves surrounded by difficult people who create a bad work environment that certainly impacts relationships, job satisfaction, and job productivity. And let's call them what they are, they're jerks at work. With joining me in a conversation on how to identify and work with difficult people is Dr. Tessa West, professor of psychology, in the Department of Psychology at New York University. Dr. West is also author of the book entitled Jerks at Work, Toxic Coworkers and What to Do About Them. And Dr. West also has a brand new book entitled Job Therapy, Finding Work That Works for You. And so thanks so much for joining the conversation. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited about this conversation today. Well, you know, before we get into some of our uh, difficult colleagues at work, Give us a quick um, overview in terms of your new book, um, in terms of job therapy. What is that about? Yeah, so Bob, I've been studying relationships for 20 years now. Um, everything from who we date and fall in love with, to how we talk to our physicians, to how we negotiate at work with our bosses for a raise. And what I found that a lot of these relationships we have at work are really emotional. And we find ourselves kind of being tethered to jobs because of things like having our identity embedded with who we are as a worker, as a colleague. And we often kind of fall in love with careers that maybe don't love us back. And what I realized kind of over time is that the conversation around workplace happiness was starting to look like the conversation we have about relationship happiness, the things that turn us on and off, that keep us tethered to something that, you know, isn't really giving back or giving as much to us as we put in. And so I decided to kind of take this relational approach to thinking about jobs and giving people therapy and thinking about your career is just another thing that you have a relationship with, just like another person. Sounds wonderful, and indeed I appreciate the advanced copy, and it is wonderful, and I recommend it highly. Well, you know, um, I so also enjoy jerks at work, and I have to say, as I hit one chapter, I said, oh, oh well, there's so-and-so. Oh, wait a minute, there's, I know that person, and I could start naming names and making a list of, wow, I've had a lot of jerks at my work over 40-some years in higher education. <laughs> it was really funny. But when we talk about difficult people in the workplace, though, before we identify the different types, um, they do generate some problems. What's some of the problems that difficult people can generate at work? I think kind of... One of the main things that these difficult people do is they, they make us question ourselves and what our contributions are. I think kind of one of the more surprising things I learned when I was doing research for Jerks at Work is that when people are on the receiving end of this bad behavior, they start to feel really guilty. They start to ask themselves, what am I doing wrong? Um, you know, why is it the case that no matter how hard I work, someone steals my ideas or they, they bulldoze a meeting? And it creates a simple sense of helplessness among people that I think most of us feel ill-equipped to handle. And I don't know about you, but I was never trained on how to deal with difficult people. I never received any kind of interpersonal conflict management training at work. It's all about the skills training. It's not about dealing with difficult people. So I feel like a lot of us kind of missed that day in, in school and could use a little bit of help. And, you know, you even also mentioned that, that it can impact your own personal health in terms of anxiety, sleep, relationships, and what have you. And so it can be very personal problematic beyond just the confines of the office or the work world. Well, you identify seven types of jerks at work. We don't have time to go into great detail on each of those, but I certainly want us to identify them. And um, certainly in your book, you describe in great detail how to cope and handle them. But let's do an overview. And the first group is the kiss up and kick downers. Who are they? This is my favorite type of jerk at work to, to write about, to talk about. Um, if you work long enough, you will encounter someone who knows how to make the boss happy, who knows how to climb the ladder. Um, they know how to manage the reputation at work. But they kick down to people who are at their own level or the level beneath them. And so it can be very difficult to kind of troubleshoot with this type of jerk at work because if you complain to your boss, he'll say to you, oh, you must be envious of this person's performance. You know, they're, they're pretty tricksy. And as a researcher who studies status and power in the workplace, they're, they're kind of one of the more complicated types of people. But they're quite good at what they do, and they tend to have a lot of talent. And what about the credit stealers? And I tell you, I know them by the dozens. I mean, I tell you. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think in academia, credit ceiling is all over the place. And I think one of the reasons why it's tough is because allocating credit, knowing who deserves credit for what, is a really hard process. And I think what's really interesting about most credit stealers is they'll actually give you credit for something. So they don't steal all the credit. In fact, they're great at kind of public recognition of certain things so that should you accuse them of stealing credit for other things, they have a pretty good reputation to stand on. And I think, you know, often it's the case that we don't really know who deserves credit for things. A lot of work goes on behind the scenes, and we trust one another. Most credit stealers are bosses or, or close colleagues. They're not strangers that you don't know well at work. And what about those bulldozers? <laughs> if you've ever been in a meeting where you talk and talk and talk and the decision never is made, you end in an impasse, you probably have a bulldozer on your team. Um, the good ones have a lot of power and status. They've been working at the place for a long time, and they know how to go behind the scenes to make people in power question the authority of the team. They'll say things like, we didn't really have a fair process, so I don't think we should really hire this person. And a lot of that work is kind of outside of the domain of the team members, but all they know is that nothing is getting done, despite the fact that they're all working really, really hard to make a decision. You know, the next one, of course, is free riders. And my goodness, that's another very popular, difficult individual. I think most of us have encountered free riding at work. You know, I teach a relationships course and I make them do graded group projects, which is any undergraduate's least favorite thing in the world, I think, because of free riding. But what most of us don't realize is free riders tend to be very charismatic and well liked, they tend to be fun to hang out with. And we allow them to get away with some of this free riding because they bring a certain energy to our team that is kind of hard to replace. Uh, you know, and even if you call out a free rider, usually they're pretty good at kind of allocating the work evenly among people so no one person feels the burn. So it's really d tough to get rid of these people from our team. And micromanagers. We all know this one. Um, the micromanager works the hardest and gets the least done. Um, you know, and, and this, I, I actually feel for these people. I think most of them are ill-equipped to manage. They were promoted because they were good at their old job, not because they're good at managing. And a lot of them are very anxious workers. And I think we are in a bit of an age of anxious leadership right now um, where people don't quite know what the right thing to do is. And so they hover over your Google Docs. They're in your office all the time. They're calling you nonstop. But ironically, they're actually kind of the least effective of getting things done at work because they're constantly getting in the weeds with things they have no business being in the weeds with. And how about the neglectful bosses? Yeah, these people are interesting because what most folks don't realize is micromanagers and neglectful bosses tend to be the same person. Uh, while you're micromanaging one person, you're neglecting another. And neglectful bosses tend to kind of go in and out of micromanagement and neglect. They will kind of show up at the 11th hour and say, I want you to redo all of this work. Let's start all over again, change everything, you do it, and then they disappear again for three months. And so they kind of go in and out of um, kind of paying attention to their team. The neglect and the micromanagement are two sides of the same coin. And we have gaslighters. These are the only type of jerk I, I talk about in my book that I think truly have some kind of pathological motivation, <laughs> um, you know, behind their behavior. So gaslighting is, is a word we've been throwing around in the zeitgeist for a while. Um, I talk about gaslighters as really isolating people socially and, you know, lying with the intent of deception on a grand scale. And that could be anything from getting a, a coworker or a direct report to do your dirty work for them to making you feel like you're part of something special. It's not always a bad thing. And often the victims of gaslighters, it takes them a while to realize what's going on, and then they kind of carry that negative experience, that trauma with them, um, you know, for decades, well into their next job. Well, again, um, in the book, you describe each in great detail, give examples, and also very pragmatic tips on how to deal with each of those. But let's go and ask some further questions. In other words, do jerks know they're jerks? Do difficult people know they're difficult? You know, by and large, they don't. I think <laughs> we don't. You know, I think, and the reason why I say that is because for two reasons. One, we don't live in a culture where we give very good feedback to people. Mm. Uh, you know, we smile, um, we nod, often through gritted teeth and nervousness, but we rarely kind of give people the type of small, specific behavioral feedback they know to even detect these behaviors early. So we're kind of living in this culture of niceness. 
Um, and I think there could be some reputational cost for telling people that they're difficult people. Most of the jerks that I've been brought on to kind of rehabilitate, and I do a lot of this as, as a consultant, are shocked that people find their behaviors off-putting. No one's ever told them, and they're a little bit heartbroken um, the moment we have that initial conversation. And I think for a lot of them, they're actually, you know, the cost for their behavior is just as costly to them as it is for other people. And so I think a lot of us walk around thinking these people are out to get me. They want to ruin my, ruin my career. But rarely is that actually the case. I think most jerks are, are pretty unaware of just how negative their behavior is and how impactful it is. Well, you know, you do give a couple of quizzes in your book to determine if we are jerks. And, and I took the quizzes, and I'm not going to talk about the results. I'm, I'm just going to go forward. <laughs> well, uh, one thing you said that really um, struck me, I thought, was that jerks are especially critical when work needs to be done in teams and collaboration. And so much of the work today is, is in that mode. But that is where they can be most destructive. Absolutely. If we can think about sort of work jerkery as a broad framework, let's think about all the ways in which, you know, one could, could disrupt a team. So if you have a kiss up, kick downer, they're really good at sort of isolating those high status team members, the people who have respect and admiration, aligning with those folks and status climbing, um, you know, and they're smart about things like not jockeying for status if someone has more power than them. They know exactly who they can insult publicly and privately. So small behaviors like that can disrupt the status hierarchy at work. You know, bulldozing disrupts group decision making. Free writing makes it impossible for us to allocate work fairly. Micromanagement makes it impossible for teams to get work done effectively if their manager won't leave them alone. Neglect makes it very difficult to process checks. So I think all of these jerks play a really critical role in our ability to effectively coordinate and execute on team goals. Well, you know, I, I will probably get in trouble for asking this question. Um, and it won't surprise many people at home either watching the show, but are men more jerks than women? Is there a gender difference in jerks? I love this question. I think you know, initially the research would suggest that yes, but that's because it was um, a lot of work looked at dominance behaviors, which tend to be more masculine traits, um, you know, compared to kind of more communal behaviors. From that lens, there is some evidence that yes, men are more likely to bulldoze, talk over people, things like that. But what the research actually suggests is that women are more likely to be victimized by jerks, but men and women are equally likely to be jerks. Um, the way that they manifest that jerkery behavior is a little bit different. Women, you know, tend to kind of work behind the scenes. They're so socially kind of more complicated when it comes to, you know, how they execute on goals like being dominant. Um, but it's really about the person who's the target where we find these gender differences, not so much the perpetrator. Interesting. And uh, can we say that there are some professions that you might encounter more jerks? I mean, for example, I would think a a scientist who might be more individually working, maybe not needing to be collaborative. I mean, I guess there are professions that you might encounter these types of jerks more frequently. Is that safe to say? I think that's probably true, but I would take a step back and say it probably depends on the incentive structure of the organization and how zero sum that incentive structure is, um, real mm -hmm. or imagined. So a scientist, for example, might feel like an individual contributor. But at the end of the day, if they're working with a team of other scientists to figure out authorship of a paper, well, there's only kind of one first author and then in a lot of sciences, last author, anchor author. And so they're going to be jockeying for those positions in much the same way that, say, a lawyer is going to try to make partner when only two of them get to make partner. So it has a lot to do with sort of what the organization or the industry incentivizes and how zero sum that incentive structure is. I think that is kind of like the, the core thing around why some industries breed more jerks than others. Are there, it seems that our, our culture has gotten a little bit more coarse, combative. We talk about the divides and all of that. Um, are there tending to be more jerks now than decades ago? I mean, in other words, are jerks at work increasing? This is a really interesting question I've been thinking a lot about in terms of like generational differences um, in workplace behavior and leadership. I don't know if work jerks have increased, but I do know that the sort of norm to complain about them on social media has shifted. Now we're in an era where if you don't like your boss or you don't like the company you work for, you can make a TikTok video about it and get millions of views. And I've worked for people that are coming to me and saying, 
can I get general counsel involved in this? Is this a violation of, you know, privacy agreements? So the, the complaining about the jerks has definitely shifted where younger generations are much more comfortable complaining. Uh, you know, Gen X was much more kind of suck it up, deal with it. And the, the jerk behavior was contained within the office. It didn't kind of spread through social media. The way the information gets spread through networks has changed. Whether, you know, we're, we're worse jerks, I don't know. There's just more creative ways to be jerks now also, I think, with Slack channels and things like that as well. And, you know, by prototype, and it's terrible to generalize, I know, but looking at some of the characteristics of Gen Z being more upfront, maybe a little bit more brash, uh, within the workplace, intergenerational, that alone misunderstanding and some of the personalities, I guess, you may come across um, a little bit more difficult. Is that a fair thing to say? I think so. I think, you know, we're just starting to, as a scientific community, understand how strong these generational differences actually are. I think where you see the real divide is in how you actually confront and deal with someone who's engaged in these behaviors. Older generations were much more comfortable having one-on-one -on -one conversations, mm -hmm. get real conversations where they would embrace the confrontation early. Younger generations are kind of, you know, way less confrontational, at least when it comes to face-to-face. -face. Their version of confrontation is to go online to talk about it, to go into that Slack channel. And so what you see is less extinguishing of problems early on, less conversations about these things, that I think is a, is a is a generational divide. That kind of comfort around discomfort <laughs> in, in those kinds of workplace conversations. Well, you know, this one may not have a correct or wrong answer, but um, having been in administrative position for 32 of my 34 years in higher ed, but suppose you're a supervisor and one of your uh, problematic people uh, applying for a job, and you get a call to serve as a reference for this individual. And you kind of put in that bind, do I say, no, this person is a jerk, it's difficult, doesn't get along, but that means you may be stuck with them, and, and, but do you yeah. be on it? I mean, in other words, that's kind of an interesting dilemma for supervisors. Any advice you would share on that issue? Yeah, this is such an interesting conundrum, and I would layer onto that that in a lot of companies, it's actually illegal to kind of say negative things. What we tend to find is that... Um, if you are trying to get a reference for someone who's a jerk, you just end up getting a lot of crickets back, a lot of non-responding, <laughs> no emails, no returned calls. You know, I reached out to 30 people who used to work with this person, and not a single one of them is willing to talk to me. And so that tends to be the norm now, not actually saying negative things. Um, you know, people aren't even honest during exit interviews and things like that. So we are living in a culture where people are stifling any negative feedback that they feel, and we have to read the tea leaves to figure out, you know, oh, is it this person's a jerk? Or are they just not returning my call because they're on vacation? So I think, you know, it is very difficult to know how to talk about someone without damaging the reputation. The advice I would give is I always, in, in moments like this, I always lead with, I'm going to tell you the exact behavior the person did. If I start to editorialize that, I apologize. I don't want to talk about how I feel about it. I'm going to tell you what they did, and you can take from that what you want. So stick to the behaviors as much as you can, as long as you have documentation of those things. So if it comes back to you, you're on solid footing, and this isn't just about kind of spreading gossip about someone. Oh, very good, very good. One thing that you said that, that, that I'd like for you to expand on a little bit, you say the anecdote to jerks at work is friends at work. That's interesting. Please explain. Yeah. I think a lot of us try to deal with difficult people by ourselves. We feel like we are isolated. Um, in fact, a lot of jerks, kind of that's what they do. They socially ostracize. They make you feel like you don't have that help. But almost all of the kind of strategies I talk about in this book are about learning through network connections. You know, not just a personal friend, but someone who's well-networked at work they don't necessarily need to have status and power. They can just know a lot of folks to help you understand how widespread the problem is and who in your organization actually cares. And that's a little bit of a cynical perspective, but not every boss or manager or HR person is going to be interested in hearing your sob story. You need to kind of figure out what your narrative is, how you should get people to care, and who within your network you can use to kind of get that advice. And so I'm all about learning how to network strategically at work, to get the lay of the land, to understand how widespread something is, 
and just frame up your arguments in ways that allow you to kind of perspective take from the position of the person who you're actually going to complain to. What uh, are some coping strategies? You mentioned some in your book, but if you find yourself and uh, in, in having difficult with colleagues, how should, what are some of the strategies you should utilize? Yeah, this is an interesting problem, and I think, you know, I found actually in my research for job therapy, um, I'll, I'll answer your question with some with newer data that I've collected on what stresses people out at work. And kind of what's interesting is the things that we anticipate stressing us out in the morning tend to be difficult people. Um, you know, they tend to be that boss who we think is going to yell at us, that colleague who's going to shoot us dirty looks during our presentation. Um, but most of the strategies that are effective are actually all about sort of like putting small steps in place to prevent that person from negatively impacting your emotions in the moment. So there's kind of these long-term strategies of building structures and systems to ensure things like accountability for work. Um, but there's also little things you can do. You know, if you have to sit in a meeting with someone who stresses you out, I study anxiety and anxiety contagion. The smartest thing you can do is not sit across from them, even if it's far. It's sit on the same side as them. So you're not exposed to their nonverbal behaviors, to those cues that are going to stress you out. If someone yells at you like a boss, go take 10 minutes in your office to calm down and take a deep breath before you meet with a colleague because chances are you're going to leak that stress and they're going to catch it. So there are small things you can do when you're anticipating these stressors. And what I found um, in my work for job therapy is insofar as we can anticipate, we build structures and systems to prevent those stressors from actually negatively impacting us. And most of us have a lot of routine experience with jerks. So we know exactly kind of when they're going to show up and what they're going to say. Build those systems in place and surround yourself with those colleagues and the social network connections that can kind of buffer you from the negative impact of that person. You talked about in the, in the book about some misconceptions about jerks. My goodness, we know what jerks are. We can define them. We see them. We can name them. But what are the misconceptions about jerks? I think there's a few. I think... You know, one is that jerks tend to be people who don't have much talent or skill, they're not well-liked, and so they're engaging in this behavior because it's the only way they can get ahead, um, that they have sort of turned to these alternative strategies that torture you um, to move up at work. And I think most of the time that's not true. Most of the jerks we encounter learned these behaviors. They were reinforced through structures and systems that gave them, you know, raises for these behaviors, or their boss acted like this. And there's a lot of kind of just, um, you know, learning by doing and, and so forth with jerks. And I think the major second misconception is that our boss knows and doesn't care. Um, we have a bit of a spotlight effect on our, on our own kind of outcomes and emotions at work. We think that when we're miserable, everyone around us knows, and they just aren't doing anything about it. But most of the time, everyone's kind of living in their heads. And so don't assume that your boss or manager or even your coworkers know what you're going through if you haven't explicitly talked to them about it because a lot of work jerkery happens behind the scenes. Jerks are clever. They don't do it in public. They do it in subtle ways that give them plausible deniability. And I think we got to kind of really deal with that spotlight effect and get past that assumption. You know, we only have three minutes or so remaining, but, you know, we are in the middle of, of an election. Uh, we know we become polarized um, and, and, and galvanized in terms of parties and intents uh, in politics. Is it best to try to have some generalized rules about office discussions about politics or religion or something like that? I mean, does that help to be preventive in trying to have some standards or norms or expectations about discussing politics or political paraphernalia at your desk or what have you? Absolutely. Um, I, my opinion on this question has changed like over the last, you know, eight years or so. But here's what the research suggests. There's been some big polls lately asking people if they're actually comfortable talking about politics at work. And bipartisan support, universally people say no. They, they don't actually want these conversations. And it's not even that they necessarily feel like they don't identify with or agree with people. We're often around like-minded people, but we can't assume we know how, what people are thinking. But even when they agree with their coworkers, they don't find these conversations about politics, you know, unless you're in a politics department <laughs> in a university, appropriate at work. They find them to be distracting away from their work goals and emotionally charged in ways that are not helpful for them to be productive in the workplace and for them to build relationships. Um, and so... By and large, what most people prefer is to not have political conversations in the workplace. And I know that they can happen, and they happen in mine all the time. I'm in academia. 
But just keep in mind that even if people are engaging, most people's preference is to not talk about these kinds of things. Well, that's fantastic. Well, you know, I have to tell you, I very much enjoyed uh, your book, uh, Jerks at Work. It was a wonderful read, very informative. It's good for both supervisors and those folks who work. And also, I'm happy to commend your new book in job therapy. Thank you so much. And that is all the time we have. And I'm certainly grateful for Dr. West for joining us. And as always, I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.